3. Uh, let's just read real quickly um, verse 15 and verse 16, and then we'll kind of dive into the sermon, all right? Revelation 3 and verse 15, and it says this. I know thy works, this is Jesus speaking, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Tonight, I want to uh, speak on a sermon entitled, A Culture of Being Okay. A Culture of Being Okay. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day you've given us. Uh, God, I pray that you would speak through me, and um, Lord, that you give me the right words to say. Uh, God, I don't want to hinder this sermon in any way. And uh, God, help all of us have a great night and a, and a safe travels on the way home. In Jesus' name, amen. Like I said here in, in chapter number three, three churches are mentioned. At the beginning of chapter number three, we learned about the church of Sardis. Now, the church of Sardis was... Uh, it was Christian by name, but they were, they were spiritually dead. And, and that was a pretty interesting read, if you have time to read through that. But then we also read about the Church of Philadelphia. And uh, a lot was um, said good about the Church of Philadelphia. They were experiencing a revival, and they were keeping God's word. But then as I was reading, and I got to the book of Laodicea, uh, something kind of paused me for a second. It kind of caught my attention. And so tonight, I want to talk real quickly about this church of Laodicea. Um, the way this is written, it was a letter. And so tonight, my outline is going to be shaped like a letter. My first point is the sender of the letter. And we, our second point will be the greeting of the letter, then the subject of the letter, the um, the body of the letter, and then finally the closing of the letter. And we will walk through this quickly, but since it is a letter, we're going to walk through this letter. So with that being said, I did entitle my culture, or my title of my message, A Culture of Being Okay. I remember when I was playing sports in high school, there was a quote that we always said. It says, um, it says your good is better, uh, and never let it rest until your good is better, and your better is best. That's something we always said of trying to better ourselves. Whether you're playing sports or you run a business or the way you run your home or the way you clean out your vehicles, most people always try to do things the best that they can. But I feel like here in America, and I, I know I'm young, but just from what I've seen, sometimes I feel like in the churches, there is a culture of just getting by. There's a, a culture of just being okay. And here I see that Laodicea kind of falls into that same type of church. So with this, let's look at number one, the sender of the church. Who, who was writing this letter? Real quickly, look at verses 14. And unto the angel... Of the church of the Laodiceans, uh, Laodiceans, right? These things saith the Amen, the the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now Jesus is mentioned three ways here, and I real quickly I want to talk about the writer of this letter. It says that Jesus was the Amen. Now that word Amen actually came from a Hebrew word Amen. And that word means to believe. And as um, we made our way to the Greek, the word began to come up with a meaning of expressing of absolute truth. So what it's saying is Jesus is the amen. It's saying that Jesus is the affirmation of the truth of God. In 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says this. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now, also, it doesn't just say that, it says he is the amen, and it says these things say the amen, amen, sorry, the faithful and true witness. Aren't you glad that Jesus is still both of those things today? That he is still faithful and he is also still the true witness. It, it astounds me that people will still follow a religion that on a yearly basis will change what they believe. And yet they, are, they think that they have the truth. 
And that would, that would kind of bother me a little bit. That if I was in fifth grade and my teacher said, two plus two is four. But then as I got older, they said, well, actually, two plus two is five. Well, I would be scratching my head a little bit. It's awesome to know that God is still faithful and he is still true. Do you hear people saying today, well, there are no absolute truths. What you think is your own belief and what I think is my own belief. And sometimes you might hear people say, there is no absolute truth. Well, you know what you need to ask that person? Is what you just said true, right? <laughs> there, there obviously is truth in our day and age. And so it says here that he is the faithful and the true witness. But then it says this, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, we run into a, a doctrinal thing here that we have to take a little bit of time to discuss. Some people were, would, would read this and say, oh, look, see, the first thing God ever created was Jesus. Well, that could be a little prob problematic when you get into the, the deity of Jesus Christ. So, well, what does that exactly mean? Well, when it says the beginning, the, that definition of that word beginning means a source or the origin. So, so Jesus is the source of... Of the creation of God. Real quickly, if you have your Bibles, go to Colossians chapter 1. Hold your place in Revelation 3 and go to Colossians chapter 1. Once you make your way there, go ahead real quickly and look at verse 13. Colossians 1 and verse 13, it says this. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated, uh, translated unto us into the kingdom of his dear son. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. So we, we are talking about Jesus here. And then verse 15, it says this. Who is the image of the invisible God. So when it says the image, think of like a copy. So Jesus is a copy of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now once again, what exactly is that saying here? The, the, when it uses the word firstborn, it's showing that, hey, Jesus existed before the creation of the world. Now, we still run into the problem. Well, did God create Jesus and then create the world? Well, you could go to verses like John 1.10, which says this. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So when we go back to Revelation chapter 3, when it, when it says he is the beginning of the creation of God, it's not saying that God created Jesus and then created the world. No, that's not exactly what it's saying. It's showing that Jesus is God here in this verse. So Jesus is the author, he is the writer of this letter to the church of Laodicea. Now, why, out of all the words that Jesus could use when he is right here, why would he use the word, the beginning of the creation of God? Well, if you were to look at a map, the church of Laodicea was actually only about 8 to 10 miles away from the church of Colossae. Now, obviously, we just turned to Colossians Chapter 1. And the, the church of Colossae struggled with the deity of Jesus Christ. And some people think that kind of moved its way over to the church of Laodicea. So I find it interesting that they stick in the beginning of the creation of God. So Jesus is the writer of this book. Secondly, we're going to look at the greeting of the letter. Usually when you write a letter, you say, dear so-and-so. Well, in this letter, it's dear Laodicea. So let's talk about the, the church of Laodicea for a moment to get some context to what's being said here. In AD 60-ish, um, about 20 to 30 years before this was kind of written, there was a major earthquake that took place in this region of the world. And Laodicea took it upon themselves to rebuild their city. They, they didn't want outside help, and they were successful. They, they were able to do it. This was a thriving um, city. They, they were a, also a very wealthy city. There was a lot of um, textile industries in there, whether it was Nike or Under Armour, I'm not sure, but they were known for having a booming economy. They also had an, an eye salve that was uh, transported across the world. 
So this was a, a thriving city. It was a very wealthy city, and they were well off to do, so to say. Everything seems good in the city of Laodicea. But the city of Laodicea had one problem. Because it was such a booming city, they actually outgrew their water source. They didn't have enough water to support everyone living there. So they actually had to go about five to six miles away. Um, and, sorry, yeah, five to six miles away. And they went to Hierapolis, and they, they had to build an aqueduct. They, they had to get some way to transport the water to their city. So the water would, 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 would flow over these large rocks that they built themselves, this, this passageway. And once it made its way to the city, it then broke off into different pipes, a different piping system throughout the city. So can you imagine with the sun just shining down and that water probably taking a couple hours to make its way to the city, that water would probably begin to get a little warm once it made its way to the city. But other than that, it was a great city. It was a booming city. So we, so far, we have seen the writer of the letter. Well, we've seen the greeting of the letter. We know who we're writing to. Now, let's begin to look at the subject of the letter. Why did Jesus write to the church of Laodicea? Well, we read it earlier. Look at verses 15 and verse 16. He says this. I know thy works. That thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that were cold or hot. So when because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Man, could you, could you imagine being the person opening this letter? <laughs> Look, we got a letter today. Let's, let's read what it says. And, Thou art neither cold nor hot, and I will spew thee out of my mouth. Ooh, if we got that letter today as a church, we'd be in trouble. We'd need to fix some things. This was probably not an easy letter to read. As we look at the subject of the letter, there's two things I want to look at. And number one, I want to look at the church of Laodicea was unhappy. The church of Laodicea was unhappy. Well, why might that be? They, they were stuck between two worlds. They, they had just enough of Jesus to, to be happy in him, but they were just enough in the world to be happy with the world. And, and now they're kind of stuck in this happy medium. Um, I think about the life of Judas. And now we, we talk about Judas a lot, and uh, but sometimes if you stop and think, he, he was trusted enough to to be the ruler of the money. He's the one who, who ran the finances of the disciples. And Judas, I'm sure he, he listened to Jesus every single day. And, and maybe there's a little part of him that believed what Jesus was saying. But at the same time, Judas had just enough love of the world and just enough love of money that now he's caught in a situation where he has to make a decision. Do I follow God or do I follow my love for money? And this is where the church of Laodicea was. One preacher said this, deep down, there is no one more miserable than the lukewarm Christian. They have too much of the world to be happy in Jesus, but too much of Jesus to be happy in the world. Now, what a powerful quote. And you look at the churches of America, and I think for a majority of them, they could maybe fit in here. Yeah, it's fun coming to church, but throughout the week, it feels like you can never get your Christianity kick-started again. And then you have this long week at work, and you're having trouble with temptation. Then you come back to church, and it's a good Sunday. But then Monday through Friday happens again, and you're kind of stuck in this cycle of life of oh, being okay, of, of just getting by as a Christian. Charles Spurgeon said this about a lukewarm church. They have prayer meetings, but there are very few present, for they like quiet evenings home. They may have schools, they may have Bible classes and preaching rooms and all sorts of agencies, but they might as well be without them, for no energy energy is displayed, and no good comes from them. They are neither hot for the truth, nor hot for conversions. 
nor hot for holiness, because they are not fiery enough to burn the stubble of sin, nor zealous enough to make Satan angry, nor fervent enough to make a li- uh, um, sorry, uh, fervent enough to make a living sacrifice of themselves upon the altar of their God. They are neither cold nor hot. I was reading an article, and every year, over five hundred thousand armadillos die on the roadways. Now, I'm sure you have probably seen a a dead armadillo somewhere as you were driving. And although they have a tank-like skin, they're they're tough, they they make their way to the middle of that street, and it's just a little bit too late for them to recognize that where they are standing is the danger zone. It is because of that that the armadillo has a nickname of the hillbilly speed bump, right? How many of you have ever heard an armadillo called that? A hillbilly speed bump, right? They make their way into the middle of the street. They can keep going. They can go back. But sometimes they kind of just sit there. Maybe they think that I'm a tough armadillo. If something comes along, I'll just roll up and I'll defend myself. But here comes a semi-truck and it completely ends their day, right? They, They get to the very middle and find out, oopsie, I have made a mistake. Maybe as we begin to examine ourselves a little bit tonight, we'll find ourselves that we are in the middle of the road. We're not hot and we're not really cold. We're kind of stuck here. And maybe you'll find yourself in this rut of not being able to overcome. So I think that the church of Laodicea were an unhappy people. But the, the basis of my sermon is this. The church of Laodicea was useless. The church of Laodicea was useless. See, cold water is refreshing. Now, on, on a hot day of working outside, you walk inside, and man, there's that ice-cold glass of water or, or an ice-cold glass of sweet tea or whatever you like. Normally, you want to be cold. Why? Because it, it refreshes you. Maybe when you're sick and you have that high fever, one of the, the best things that you could do that helps you feel better is to Go into the shower and what? And turn that water as hot as you can. Why? Because hot water sanitizes. Hot water can can purify, right? But here, the church of Laodicea was in the middle. They they weren't hot and they weren't cold. They were useless. I wonder if God was to write a a letter to Tri-City Baptist Church, where would we be? Would we be the church of Philadelphia that's having revival and and we're serious about seeing conversions and we love one another and we're excited to come to church and we're excited to have worship? Or would we be a church that, yeah, some of us are happy, some of us are here just to be here, some of us are forced to be here, and we're kind of just going along with the flow? See, they were useless because it became an everyday thing. Pretty soon, this became lukewarm prayer. When they go home, they might say a prayer before they eat, and maybe they'll say a prayer with their kids before they go, they go to bed, but they don't expect anything to come from their prayers. They, they may have lukewarm worship. When, when they come to church, yeah, they're, they're singing a hymn, but it doesn't mean anything to them. They're, they're just going along with the flow. They're, they're thinking about lunch, and, or they're thinking about what they have to get done after church, and because of that, they have some lukewarm worship. Maybe there's some lukewarm passion. You're struggling to to serve in that ministry that you've been serving in because you have become lukewarm. Maybe there are some um, lukewarm decisions. Teenagers, we were at camp almost two months ago. And those decisions you made at camp, are you still keeping up with them? Maybe you find yourself, this week you did good, but this week you did bad. Well, what's your problem? Maybe you have become a little bit lukewarm. I wonder if we were sincere with ourselves and sincere with this church what would we look like? If God said to us, as he did in verse 15, he says, I know thy works. If God walked into this room tonight, he says, hey, I know your works, what would our first thought be? Uh-oh, I hope he didn't see my Sunday school class. Uh-oh, I hope he didn't see when I took out the trash and I forgot one on the floor. I wonder what our first thought would be when, if God came and says, hey, I know your works. There was, I will never forget, there was a, a man who came to West Coast Baptist College when I was at college there. His name was William Miracle. It's a pretty cool name when you're a missionary. And he was actually a missionary in China. Uh, I know very few make make their way into China, but he had been there for a couple years. 
I have never, I, I don't ever remember being more convicted than I was that day he, when he was preaching. He began to explain to me, this, or to the, the auditorium, of what their normal church service looked like. They would, one by one, maybe a couple minutes apart, make their way to some type of small room. Because they didn't want a bunch of traffic in case people might notice, hey, for some reason, a bunch of people are going to this one room. So they would kind of space out. Hey, you come at 11.05, I'll come at 11.10, so-and-so will come at 11.15, so that no one would really realize what was taking place. And then once everyone was inside of that room, they would take some type of material to cover the doors and the walls to kind of keep the sound in. And then they said that as they would begin to sing hymns and they would begin to preach, they would have to face back. Because they didn't want to be caught. Because they didn't want to get caught. And they knew that if they got found, they would be put into prison or they would be put into jail or they would have something come about their lives because they went to church. Imagine if all vehicles stopped tomorrow, all vehicles stopped working, and you live one mile away from church. Would you still come? A fiery Christian says, oh yeah, no problem. Kids, let's wake up. Let's go to church. But a lukewarm Christian might begin to second-guess that. Well, it's hot outside. Well, uh, I don't have my Gatorade with me. I don't know if I can make it there and back. They became a useless church. And I think as you look around the churches in America, I think a lot of churches fall under this category of being useless. People show up. There's a couple songs. There's a sermon. And they go home. And nothing is really happening. I was reading an article a couple weeks ago, and this quote stunned me. If something happened to our church, and we no longer were able to come together as we are tonight, would the community that we serve have any idea that we shut down? Because a lukewarm church is useless. They're, they're not making an impact in their society. If Tri-City Baptist Church shut down tonight, would anyone out there have any idea? So we saw the subject of the letter. He says, I write you, hey, I know your works. You're neither hot nor cold. Now, real quickly, let's look at the body of the letter. He is going to write to them, hey, this is what you're doing wrong, and this is how you need to fix it. Real quickly, look at verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. See, the problem with this church is that they ignored the reality of their spirituality. They say, oh, I'm good. I I'm good where I am. I'm a good Christian. Everything's fine. But under the surface, if they were to be honest with themselves, God says, well, hold on a second. No, no. You are wretched. You are miserable. You are poor. You are blind. And you are naked. See, if we're not careful, when we look at ourselves, we, we look at ourselves in line with, okay, what does my neighbor think about me? What does my friend think about me? What, what does my family think about me? But sometimes it's completely, it's a different, completely different view when we say, okay, what does God think about me? See, you can maybe see the excuses that this church come up with. Oh, well, we're wealthy. We have beautiful buildings. We're considered a thriving church. They might say, hey, we are independent. We have built this church up. When that earthquake happened, we rebuilt everything. We're, we're a good church. They might say, oh, we are hardworking. They might say, hey, we have some wealthy members. We're not in danger of our church shutting down anytime soon. Uh, we maybe have a, a growing church. We get people to come in. And there's a lot of excuses that maybe they could make to try to show themselves, hey, we're okay. But God had something different to say about that church. But then God gives them a solution. He goes, hey, you think you're something, but you're really not. But here's what you need to do. Look at verse 18. I counsel thee to, to buy of me gold tried with fire, that thou mayest be rich, 
and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Okay, so they're, they're put in a situation here. God's saying, hey, you are useless. You're, you're a useless church. Okay, you're not doing anything for the kingdom of God. And he, you think you're great when you're really not. Now, how do they fix it? Look at the very beginning of verse 18. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried with fire. When you buy something, you have to usually, you have to invest something to get it, all right? Things aren't free in our day and age. So in, in order to, to change how they are, they have to completely invest with God, what, what God can give them. They can't just lousily get through this. They have to do something that sincerely changes what they do. We'll quickly look at verse 19. He continues, as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. That word repent means to change one's mind. So in order for them to get out of this rut of being useless, of being lukewarm, they have to sincerely invest in God and change their mind about how they view themselves. Hey, I think I'm doing okay. Now, God, I want you to show me what I really look like on the inside. And when God says, hey, you're wretched, you're poor, you're miserable, you have to be able to say, okay, I'm going to change how I've been doing things. I'm going to strive to do something new. And then I, I, I love these verses. Uh, we maybe hear these verses preached out, preach about a bunch. Uh, verse 20, it says this, behold, I, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcome, and am set down with my father in his throne. Now, we hear these verses a lot of times used when it comes to salvation, which I think it definitely applies to that. But here Jesus is standing. He's standing in front of the door of Laodicea. He said, I'm standing here. I'm knocking. Only thing I need this church to do, this useless church, is to hear my voice and open the door and let me in. Sincerely ask yourself, is God welcome in our church? Well, pff, yeah, of course. We, we want God to be a part of it. Now, how does your life reflect that? Now, there, down in, here in the south, I've noticed... There are a lot of different ways to enter someone's house. You, you have those people that when you walk up to the door, you just know. You can open the door and you can walk right in. Hey, is anyone home? Because you, you have that relationship with that person. There's other people that you can kind of walk up and as you're opening the door and you're halfway in, is anyone home? I just want to make sure. But then there's other people. You have to come to the door, knock, knock, knock. Anyone home? Ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. Yeah, come on in. Okay, and they walk on in. There's other people that then the, 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 the front door's open and then the, the heavy door's closed. You can't see in and you ring the doorbell and then five minutes later they come. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Come on in. There's a lot of different ways that you can enter into a house. I wonder how freely God is invited into your life. Is God sitting there going, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. And we ignore, and we ignore, and we ignore because, hey, I'm wealthy, I have a good family, I go to a good Christian school, I'm okay where I am. And because you are ignoring God and ignoring God, you are now stuck in a rut of uselessness. And this is where the church was. If you look back at verse 20, it says this. I want you to look at a couple words here. Behold, I, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice. Now, he, he's kind of stopped talking about the church as a whole. He, he's now focusing on the individuals that are in that church. Because a church is built up of individual believers. So, he's saying, if any man. Not if the church will open its doors. He's saying, hey, is there anyone in that church willing to open their doors to me? Because when a man is willing to open the door. When a man is saying, hey, God, use my life. God, anything you ask, I'm willing to do it. That individual can begin to change a church. A lot of times when you see a church that it is stuck and it's not doing anything, it's useless, 
you begin to look around at individuals, and all of them are the exact same way. If so-and-so does a little too much, they get made fun of. Well, how dare you be the tryhard? And then if I try to go out to outreach, well, why are you going to outreach? It's Saturday morning. Don't you know college football is on? And they begin to make excuses about each other. So he says, will any man hear my voice and open the door? I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The church can only get right by every man getting right. Now, real quickly, I want to look at the close in the letter. We, we've walked through here. We know what the problem is. God tells them how to fix it in verses 18 and 19 and verse 20. Hey, you think you're something. You're really not. The only thing you have to do is invest in me. Hey, hey, buy into me. Buy my gold. Buy my raiment. Because remember, that they're a booming economy. They had their eye salve that they sell across the world, and they had their textile industries. And God says, hey, you are focusing too much on what you can provide for yourself, but hey, I need you to buy into me. And then we get to the close of the letter in verse 22. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that hath an ear. Well, I can't remember the last time I saw someone who, who didn't have an ear. So I think he's talking to most of us in this room. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. For a moment here, I want you to look inwardly. Is there something pricking your heart? Is God saying, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong? Because we better listen. Now, I, sometimes you preach sermons like this, you're like, man, pastor, you can probably think this church is horrible, okay? No, that, that's not what I'm saying. I, I love this church, but I think in the Bible there are certain passages that we have to look at as a warning to other churches. And before we get to the point where we are completely useless, we have to ask ourselves, are we allowing God through that door? Do we want him to come through that door? If God does come through that door and he wants to change something about me, am I willing to let him do it? He says in verse 22 once again, if you have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Go ahead and close your eyes and bow your heads, no one looking around. Tonight, we learned about one church that had a big problem. Yeah, they had a lot of money. They had probably beautiful buildings. They had great people maybe within their church. But they had gotten to a point of uselessness. I pray that that never happens to this church. That we would be a church that always has an open door. It says, God, I want, you present with, um, I want you present with us here today. Dear me, Father, thank you so much for this day you've given us. God, thank you so much for this passage and this great warning to, to all the churches. God, I, I pray that in this tri-city area that we would be an impact in our society. That when people hear about our church, that we are a church that is thriving. That, that we're, we're on fire. We have some zeal about us. God, I pray that we would never get to the point that you would look at us and say, wow, that is a useless church. God, we love you. Thanks so much for all you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. As you stand to your feet, please turn to page 496 in your hymn books. Page 496, we're going to sing a, sing a couple stanzas. Uh, if God has spoken to you, the altar is open. And so page 496. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All right. Thank you guys so much for coming tonight. I hope you all have a good rest of your weekend and uh, continue to pray for Pastor Bailey as he, he preaches this week. And um, hope you all have a good holiday. Uh, Matt P., could you close us in a word of prayer, please?